and welcome to the Conagher Podcast channel. This is episode 41, the 16 dynasties or Shuliogwa and the Northern and Southern Dynasties period. Now firstly, I'd like to say a huge apology for my lack of activity lately. This was something I did not expect, but when it came to finding out anything about this rather chaotic and interesting topic in Chinese history, I was really struggling. On top of this, I have had loads of issues with my VPN, which I need to do my research. And finally, for the past couple of weeks, my chest was just wheezing, I was coughing my guts up, my throat was sore, and let's be honest, nobody wants to hear a guy coughing into a microphone or sounding like death is calling on them. So all activity was postponed until I started the ship. Now, it is safe to say the ship is steadied, and that is that. But you may hear my voice going a little bit. I'm not fully recovered, but I'm more or less there. Now, hopefully, moving forward, everything should go well. But because I have been terrible with time management this year, I'm going to give myself more breathing space. So I will say every new episode will be released in a two-week period from now on. So this episode will be released on the 19th of December and the next one will be after the new year on the 2nd of January. Oh wow, this is the last episode of 2021? Now that's a scary thought. Anyway, on with the topic at hand. The 16 dynasties or the northern and southern dynasties period was like the spring and autumn or warm states period in the sense that China was in a lot of chaos and of course it was divided. But It's different, because there was no new great philosophies emerging from China, which is what happened during the spring and autumn period. And during the 16 dynasties period, it's a time of foreign invasion, and not just foreign people coming in, but foreign ideas, and in particular Buddhism. Now, I'll get more into Buddhism later on, but the way in which I'm going to break down this chaotic period into one single podcast is going to look like this. So we'll start off with uh, a prelude and what happened when the Western Jin fell, what happened in the north, how Buddhism managed to spread a lot quicker than it had before, and of course what happened in the south. Now a lot of the information that I got for this podcast was from a lecturer named Kenneth J. Hammond a professor at New Mexico State University. I heard his lectures in his book titled From Yao to Mao, 5,000 Years of Chinese History. So when I'm going through this podcast, just be aware that a lot of the information uh, that I got is coming from this guy. I found the lectures on Audible, which has been invaluable for me for doing my research. And of course, the Audible title is available on the Great Courses Plus as well. So if you're subscribed to either one of those websites, then by all means, check out the book because it's well worth a listen. As well as that, I listened to a fellow podcaster by the name of Laszlo Montgomery, who does the History of China podcast. And he goes in a lot more depth about the political side of things than what I will be doing. So go and check it out. For me, I will focus mostly on the cultural aspects of the division China found itself in once again. When the Western Jing of capital of Luoyang fell to the five barbarian tribes in 316, it basically left the north of China wide open for invasion, which is of course what happened. Now, something that you need to know is that during this period, uh, there was a huge migration coming from Central Asia like from the Turkic nomadic peoples. And these peoples, they didn't just travel east towards China. They traveled to the south towards India. And of course, they traveled to the west towards the Roman Empire too. Now, what I found interesting is the theory about what happened to the Xiongnu people at this time of great migration. The Xiongnu, as you may remember, were a thorn in the side of the Chinese for centuries even going as far back as the Qin Dynasty. But now, the Xiongnu were squeezed between the Han Chinese in northern China and these advancing Turkic peoples. A lot of them travelled into northern China, yes, 
but some travelled west and arrived in Europe. Now for all of the Roman historians out there, I'm pretty sure the name Attila the Hun will ring a few bells. Well, according to the theory, he was of Xiongnu descent. I do like this idea, not based on facts or anything, but just because it seems the Xiongnu were just continuing to do the work of their ancestors and ruining the good times for empires. They caused so much havoc for the Han, and of course the Qin, and now they pretty much decimated the Roman Empire at this stage of history. Now of course the Roman Empire had already got so many problems going for it, but the invasions of the Huns were another nail in the coffin which ended the Western Empire. Anyway, let's go back to China. As a result of these mass migrations from Central Asia, these nomadic peoples were all of a sudden on the doorstep of Chinese civilization. Who was going to win if a fight broke out? People devastated by war, already in no mood to fight, or a warrior style kind of people? Now of course the warrior style people obviously won and as a result the north of China came under foreign rule. There were several dynasties throughout the north but the largest and most prominent was the Wei Dynasty. Now there have already been a few Wei Dynasties before, such as in the Spring and Autumn, the Warren States period, and of course the Three Kingdoms, and like all of the previous, this new Wei Dynasty is not the same as the others, it's not the same family. The Wei Dynasty first established their capital at Datong, and then eventually moved it to Luoyang, which of course had spiritual significance for the Chinese that they were occupying. The dynasty was established by the Turkic peoples known as the Toba, which of course means that the ruling class isn't Han Chinese peoples, but foreign invaders. As a result, a cultural exchange began to take hold within the northern realm of China between the ruling class and the Han Chinese peoples. For example, the Turks for their part wanted to hold on to their gains in this prosperous, rich land that they had taken over. So they simply used the same mechanisms of administration that were already in place within China at the time. It makes sense, right? And by using the same mechanisms, the Turks then adopted the language of government as Chinese, which would of course make administering the land easier. And as time progressed, the governmental language just became their language. Before you know it, the Turks were adopting Chinese family names or adapting them to be more Chinese. An example of these surnames would be Yuan or Dugu, which were adapted to suit the Chinese populations these people now occupied. Now of course there was no character or Chinese character for these family names, so they had to make it Han style, which of course they did. Later on in the Northern Way, even wearing the original clothing of their ancestors was now outlawed and you were not allowed to wear it in the courts. The Chinese do have a habit of managing to absorb foreign invaders and making them more Chinese, so to speak. But remember that this is an interaction between invaders and invaded, so it's a two-way street. And it was no different here. The Chinese also adopted some customs of the Turkic peoples, particularly when it came to the food that they ate and how they prepared said food. From what I can gather, it seemed that the nomadic peoples were definitely more inclined to eat meat in their diet, whereas the Chinese, an agrarian based society, would have eaten not as much meat. When the nomadic peoples moved into the area though, meat would have definitely been more readily available for the Chinese. The social elite within China, not the rulers, also adapted to their new political reality and tried to intermingle with the new rulers to help keep their gains too. As a result, marriages were usually proposed between Turkic princes and high-standing Han Chinese women. As generations passed on, more and more families couldn't even distinguish where their ancestral homeland was. Was it China or Central Asia? What ended up happening was of course all of them just said they were Chinese because that is where they were living. And that kind of sums up everything that was happening up in the north of China. It was like a melting pot of cultures, mixing together and creating something somewhat new. Now I will say this, it was definitely the invaders who accommodated or adapted 
a lot more of Chinese customs than the Chinese ever did. So yeah, that's one thing. But one thing that the northern invaders brought with them with force was, of course, Buddhism. Now, Buddhism, like I've said previously, was introduced to China via the Silk Road, and which was established by the Han Dynasty way back when. It slowly became a popular religion amongst local populations, whereas court intellectuals and the levers of government only treated it with mere curiosity. When the people invaded from Central Asia, however, Buddhism spread throughout China like it never had before. The reason why is because the people invading were Buddhists themselves. It could be argued then that Buddhism spread through a sort of hierarchical diffusion, where the ruling class for the forced the population to adopt their religious beliefs. But actually, that wasn't really the case either. It doesn't seem like anyone was forced to adapt to Buddhism. It was more welcomed. And now it was practiced by the ruling class, which never really happened before. The rulers of the northern dynasties then began commissioning the building of temples dedicated to the Buddha throughout the north. Two in particular are really famous, and they're still standing today because they were carved into the mountains themselves. The first was in Datong, and is called Yungang, or in English, Cloud Harbour. And the second one is in Luoyang, which is called Longmen, or Dragon Gate in English. The building of these temples at Longmen was commissioned by Emperor Xiaowen of the Wei, uh, who had Toba heritage. After moving the capital to Luoyang in the year 494, he built up the new capital, then started constructing the temple complex. The complex didn't finish when the emperor died, but was added to throughout the century. But today, according to the Metz Museum, the structure today has 2,300 caves and niches filled with Buddhist art, 110,000 Buddhist stone statues, 60 stupas, or hemispherical structures containing Buddhist relics, and 2,800 inscriptions carved on steels, which are vertical stone markers. These temple complexes are a beautiful reminder of the influence Buddhism had on northern China's new rulers, and how the religion managed to take root within China. Now, it's to be noted that all of those Buddhist stone statues, some of them are massive and some of them are tiny. And it's important to note that the big ones was obviously uh, done by like princes or commissioned by princes and it was a huge project, whereas their smaller ones was carved by the local people because they wanted to worship Buddha and give offerings to him. So again, it goes to show this idea that a lot more people welcomed Buddhism when these northern invasions happened, because now it was being uh, patroned by the ruling classes. So that's Buddhism and the North kind of wrapped up there. That's all I'll really get into. But what about the South? Well, the nomads who invaded the North didn't travel to southern China at this time. Now, if I was to guess as to why, I would say the South's climate didn't really suit their nomadic lifestyles, and the South just created too much of a challenge for them to penetrate that deep into Chinese territory. Now, because of these invasions, of course, there's going to be refugees. And a lot of these Han Chinese refugees, as a result of these nomadic invasions, traveled South. And one of those refugee families were, of course, the Sima clan. And they stopped ruling from Luoyang, and they established themselves as the Eastern Jin in modern-day Nanjing. And this was between the years 316 to 420. Now, it's important to note that even though the Jin were in the, were, were in the South, they weren't the only dynasty in the South either. So the chaos that was tearing the North apart was being mirrored in the South as well. It was a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and whoever was the most powerful would prevail. The only difference between the North and South was that of the ruling elite. Like, the, in the North, it was these new Turkic peoples, or these nomadic invaders, 
whereas in the south it was still Han Chinese. Now because the Han Chinese were essentially kicked out of their native land, and I mean the north and the Yellow River Valley, there was a kind of yearning to re-establish unity. But at the same time, the south really wanted to show off their Chinese identity. The way in which they did this was through the arts and literature mostly. So let's discuss the arts first, and then we'll go on and we'll go on to calligraphy first. So calligraphy had been around in China since the spring and autumn period, where people would write their poetry or write simple phrases, and it had its functions. That's the important thing to note here. It was just a functional thing that happened. But during the 16th dynasty's period, calligraphy had taken a new step where it become or became an art form, where calligraphers would try to write in an elaborate style and show off their fancy writing and their use of the characters. The use of these characters obviously needed a lovely Chinese landscape to go beside them, so painting took off in a big way as well. However, the use of painting and calligraphy then fueled a literary art, poetry. Poetry, obviously, had been around in China for a long time as well, but it took on a new kind of form and became more elaborate with deeper cultural meanings. They would make astute references that only real Chinese people would be able to understand. And from what I can gather, it was basically the South trying to show off that they were the true Chinese. Because the North, like, it was like a constant reminder to the rulers in the North that they weren't Chinese, whereas in the South they were. That's the kind of, like, back and forth that's going on here. Now, one of the most famous scholars from the era was called Wang Shizhu. He was a scholar from the Eastern Jin Dynasty, and he wrote a very nice piece of poetry called The Orchid Pavilion Gathering, or in Chinese, the Lang Tin Ji Su. The poem was composed in 353 during the Spring Festival, or the Lunar New Year, and it describes the gathering of Wang and his scholarly friends to celebrate the ending of a new year. Now, without reading a translated poem, which usually sounds hideous, what I will do is describe what the poem says. It's the beginning of a new day for the new year. The ice is beginning to thaw and the sun is shining brightly. But not too warm yet. Within the garden of this manor in modern day Zhejiang or Shaoxing province, Wang and his 42 literati friends all celebrate the new year by the stream which runs through his gardens. The gentlemen can hear the birds chirping and they can see that spring is coming. And to celebrate, they play a drinking game. Every time a cup of wine is being sent down to them via the stream, which servants had prepared and sent downstream for them, one of the scholars who tried to take the wine would have to recite poetry or drink three cups of wine in rapid succession as a penalty. The men described the scenery around them. Looking at the tall, grand mountains, the coolness of the stream, and of course, the fact that all of them were here drinking and singing their merry songs. Eventually, it was Wong's turn, and he wrote his poem, which is described just what I was talking about there. And he composed it on his beautiful scroll, and he presented it to his friends. Everyone hailed him as one of the best poets to have ever existed. Now that there, my friends, is exactly what the poem describes. Except Wang's poem rhymes in Chinese, his use of characters have cultural and historical significance, and all in all, he composes it in such a beautiful way that even today, people in China can still recite the poem. In southern China, when more and more people heard the poem, 
They saw this as the perfect day and the absolute standard and height of Chinese culture. That, of course, led people to remember that the Chinese weren't within their ancestral homeland and that China ought to be reunited. Well, it would take some more warring and some more time, but China would be reunified under the short-lived Sui dynasty, who I will begin to cover in two weeks. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I know I haven't done this era in Chinese history much justice, but I feel I can always go back to this period, very much like the spring and autumn period, when I finished the chronological timeline that I am following for now. But that is it from me, and I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Thanks for listening.